Hello. So today is September 14th, 2015. My name is Linda Conley. I'm here at the Hopkinton Historical Society um, with Michael Danahy, who is going to tell us about um, growing up in the town of Hopkinton, Massachusetts. And this is for the Oral History Project, which is part of the 300th celebration um, funded by, uh, funded through the town and CPC monies. So Michael has contacted me from Mississippi. He's in town for the parade and the fireworks. Well, actually just the fireworks. But he's here to tell us um, about some of his memories of the town of Hopkinton. So go ahead, Michael, tell us what you'd, what you'd like to share. Okay, well, I grew up at uh, 38 Grove Street, uh, which is right near where Price Street is. Uh, in my family, my mother had four kids in four years, and we didn't have a lot of money, uh, but what I remember is um, everybody was very friendly, and I've heard that a lot on the tapes, uh, and I've been thinking about, you know, why is it that everybody had this feeling that everybody knew each other, even if they didn't really know absolutely everybody? The town was about 3,000 to 5,000 people during those years. I what was, years, Michael? Good question. Yeah. I was born in 42, Yeah. and I graduated high school with a class of 59, and then I went off to college. Uh, I came back here summers when I was working in college, um, and I'd come back for visits after that, but pretty much uh, my living here stopped in 1959 when I graduated from high school. So, but I have very, very fond memories of the place and, and thinking about what made, made it so uh, comfortable for everybody, I was thinking of uh, not just the fact that it was a, a small number of people but uh, the, the fact that uh, I think there were overlapping circles of people and there was a certain stability. A lot of people were not constantly changing houses, buying and selling. They weren't uh, job hopping a yeah. whole lot. There was a kind of stability uh, to life in the town in the 40s and 50s. Uh, not a lot of new people were coming in, but people were not moving out. There was not a lot of growth uh, and development. So uh, there was a stable pool of people who got to know each other over several generations. Uh, and I think that, that made for that feeling of people all uh, knowing each other and helping each other. Uh, one little funny story uh, to me that uh, highlights that. I started school kind of young. Uh, the, uh, I was five when I went to the first grade because wow. of the way that the calendar was arranged. I, I made the cutoff. So, and I'm sure my mother was happy to have one less kid at home at that point. <laughs> but I, I wasn't real happy about going to school at first. And I think that was probably, I, was, I wanted to be home with my mother maybe uh, and the other kids in the house. But apparently in the first grade, for instance, I would run away from school. And the place where I ran was across the common and I would go sit on the library steps. Oh, wow, wow. At the time, across the street from the library was Leslie P. Eagles. Uh, he sold insurance, I think. Now I think it's a Thai restaurant. But anyway, Mrs. Eagles would see me sitting on the library steps. She would call Dot Pond. Now why did she call Dot Pond? Dot lived down the street, down Grove Street, three or four houses. We did not have a phone and we didn't have a car. Dot had a phone and Dot had a car. So Mrs. Eagles would call Dot Pond and say that little Danny boy was sitting on the library steps again. <laughs> so Dot Pond would have to go up to this, up the street and, and tell my mother uh, and they'd come over and they'd get me. But that's how the, the town worked. It was sort of a lot of glue and maybe the kids were the glue in a way. Uh, but that was uh, that was one of the characteristics. So I that think. was like in 1947, or is uh, that yes. about what it was? Right. Yeah. On the library, right. did they ever invite you into the library? Did uh, the library know? Yeah. I started library early. Uh, I have a, a fond memory of the librarian at the time was um, Miss Marshall, and I'm not sure how professionally trained she was. Uh, 
it was an elderly woman, she wasn't married, and, and she sort of was a fairy godmother for me, and I just had this image of her. She would uh, wear these uh, diaphanous flowing dresses in these soft pastel colors that were flowers, and she kind of looked like she was out of, you know, upstairs, downstairs, or one of those shows. Uh, and she retired, and they brought in uh, Betty Strong, uh, who was a librarian for quite a while. I had trouble getting used to Betty Strong because she was so different from she was uh, harsh, right? Miss yeah. Mar yeah. <laughs> Miss Marshall. <laughs> but we got to be best friends, so I was a heavy library user actually. Yeah. So yeah. I'm glad to see that they're expanding and they're yeah. doing it in a, in a in a good way. Yeah. I think. Are you related to the Danahees of the town? Are you connected to the other Danahees from this town? The other yeah. Danahees. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, my, uh, we, basically, my mm, great-great-grandfather, I think it is, w was the uh, first Danahee in town. He came in about 1855, and his name was John. And uh, he had a whole bunch of people who have descended from him, including uh, myself, uh, Pat, Ray, and John, uh, on Grove Street. We were related to the Danahees down the lane on Cedar Street, Jack Danahe the barber. Uh, then there were the other Danahees. We assumed that we were all related, but we didn't really know how. Well, later in life, actually only about 15, 20 years ago, I got interested in genealogy. And uh, we started out with a DNA test with myself and Judge Paul Danahy. Whom and, I've met, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he lived over on Commonwealth Avenue, I think, at the time. So. Uh, you know, we would see each other at church all the time, and, and we were sociable enough, but we didn't really visit much with, with a whole slew of Danahees that lived on Mayhew and Pleasant and, and Commonwealth. But it turns out we have identical DNA. So <laughs> <laughs> we're all related somehow, but we don't yet know how. Uh, I went to Ireland mm, about 2009, I'm guessing, uh, with some of the folklore from the other Danahees <coughs> in town, Judge Paul and Jim and uh, Martin and all, all those Danahees. Uh, we knew, we assumed we were cousins. And uh, uh, Jim Danahe had been there many, many years ago and then he had uh, met a Thai Danahe over in Kerry. Uh, and so I, when I went to Ireland, uh, I knew, I was looking in the Waterville area and just by chance, I was in a, in a store, uh, it was a kayak rental operation, because my daughter wanted to go uh, rent a boat. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm looking for Dennehy's over here. Uh, do you know any? He said, oh, he's one, of, he's one of my best friends. And his name was Martin Dennehy, uh, which was a, an echo in the family tree, as it were. And uh, we got together, met in a pub, and I convinced him to take a DNA test. Wow, wow. <laughs> and our DNA is identical. Really? So, we, what we don't know is who the original male ancestor is, but uh, the Dennehy's, or let's say Commonwealth Avenue, and the Dennehy's on Grove Street and Cedar Street, yeah, uh, we have a common male ancestor um, in Ireland, and we're missing about one generation of information because the, there are no documents uh, earlier than 1830, 1840 in Ireland. So, but yeah, so the short answer is we're all related somehow. <laughs> and we're probably first cousins several times. And, no, and no stories. No, I mean, the, the, the stories about the connection have been, have been lost then, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at this point. Yeah. Um, I, I know the family history of the Martin Dennehy I met in Ireland and there's no overlap going forward past the uh, 1860s. So the, the biological connection is, is before 1860, somewhere in Kerry, probably. So interesting. Well, that, that's what they say. This area of Hopkinton was um, Kerry Hill, the top of Pleasant Street. Everybody's yes. from Kerry, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wow, so uh, interesting. And that, that, that uh, reminds me, of course, we were all Catholic. And that was a, a, another thing, I think, in the town in those days. Uh, I have a memory. They had a program called Released uh, Time for Catechism. Friday at mornings from 11 to 12, <laughs> both Catholics and Protestants, whose parents had agreed to it, 
would leave school and we'd all march from the high school, the new high school, down to wh whichever church we were going to. And I think the teachers had it arranged so that all the Catholics were on one side of Hayden Road Street walking down and we would turn left at Church Place and go to St. John's. All the Protestants had been marched down on the other side of Hayden Road Street <laughs> and they would go, I think, mainly to the Congregational Church. Uh, or I don't know whether, um, uh, is it St. Peter's? The, what, what was the Episcopal St. Church? St. Paul's, Saint yeah, St. Paul, Paul's, Bible, was, yeah. which was okay. next to the library. Right, exactly. Well, what about the Baptist Church in Woodville? Uh, you know, well, being Catholic, I don't know what happened yeah, to that. Yeah. <laughs> I, but, you know, it was, it was friendly. There were no conflicts, uh, really. So there, there was a certain kind of everybody accepted each other. Uh, it was in the, the late uh, 50s, I think, that the first Jewish person moved into town, for instance. And it, it, you know, people noted it, but there was no upsetness no or aggravation no about it. That's a little bit different from sometimes some of the tone I pick up on uh, Facebook uh, discussions of some of the populations that are moving into town now. There's a, a little bit more tension, I think, in the air than there used to be. Because um, in the schools, uh, yes, the kids all got to know each other, but um, I, had, uh, I had a couple of teachers who had taught my father. Uh, I mean, it, it, that could happen. Uh, basically. So your father grew up here also? Yes, right. And, and what about his father? His father also, yeah. There's, uh, yeah. And, and you know, it, it's just now that, uh, well my sister still lives here. That, uh, and that that's, uh, reminds me, you know, when the Hopkinton Historical Society uh, reopened the Comey Cottage over in uh, mm -hmm. the Woodville Cemetery, mm -hmm. Uh, they put in the announcements that uh, they had looked for descendants of the Comey, but the records show there were none living in town. <laughs> I said, I beg to differ, <laughs> because uh, my mother's uh, mother had been an Aldrich from Westboro, and uh, through her, uh, her grandfather, my mother's grandfather, was a fellow named Henry Alfonso Aldrich. Now, he ha came from a long, long line of Aldriches going all the way back to the 1630s with George Aldrich, who started the town of Menden. But um, in part of the line, there was a, a fellow named Seth Rawson Aldrich, uh, and he had married uh, Emily Elizabeth Comey. And she was the daughter of Comey. Hiram, yeah. and who was the daughter of uh, the, uh, the son of Royal Comey. Comey, however you want to say it. But, uh, so this Royal Comey was in town in the 1720s at least from the records. I haven't gone back further than that, uh, but there's an unbroken line through men and women uh, down to my sister Pat, uh, who has uh, from, through um, Emily Elizabeth Comey and Seth Rawson Aldrich, because uh, Seth Rawson Aldrich had a son named Henry Alfonso Aldrich, who was my mother's grandfather. Wow. So the, I, I wrote to the Historical Society and I said, no, there is a descendant of the Coleys living in town. <laughs> That's her great. Name no, is Danny. I'm glad that you're, yeah, yeah. I'm glad that you're clarifying yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, you know, for a while in genealogy, it, the focus was exclusively on the male, bearer of the male name, uh, the patronymics and all, but. Uh, and they call that daughtering out when your name dies out, but, you, yeah. but the family uh, bloodlines didn't. Anyway, yeah. so a little interesting angle there. Did your fa you have stories from your father or your, or your grandfather? Is there anything you could tell us going back? Because those memories will really be, be lost. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, grandfather died when my father was young, so I never knew my, my grandfather uh, down the lane. Uh, my grandfather Danahy. Down the lane? What, do you know which lane? Uh, yeah, that was the term they used for Cedar Street. Okay. I'm not sure that uh, early on, I don't think Cedar Street was finished uh, all the way through. Yeah, it didn't, didn't go all the right. way through. It was a swamp. Right. Yeah. And um, there was, a, uh, uh, there was a, a Bryan household there. They had a daughter named Catherine O'Brien. Catherine O'Brien married uh, a James Lanann who moved in. Uh, and in Irish culture, when the guy moves into the uh, lady's house, that's called Cleon Steach. <laughs> and that was a pattern that was uh, done in Ireland uh, very often. 
uh, in the Dennehy family. Uh, but anyway, the men the moving into the woman's house, oh, okay. right, the daughter's house. Okay. So we had a we had uh, Catherine O'Brien bringing in James Lenan, and they had a daughter named Annie, who was my grandfather, um, grandmother. Annie Lenan uh, married Tim Danahy, and Tim Danahy moved in <laughs> to the to the house. Tim was the fire chief for oh, okay. a couple of years. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think there are some pictures of him in the Historical Society uh, collection. I think they picked him to be fire chief. Well, he was a very gregarious Irishman, uh, I'm told. I did, never knew him. He died fairly young. But he was what they called a ladies' uh, uh, a man's hairdresser, a man's hairdresser, which we call a barber. And um, it was his son, Jack. Uh, he taught his trade of barbering to Jack, and, and Jack was the barber downtown. But Tim had his shop in town very near where the fire engines would be. So, so that's right, there still is a barber shop, right? Still, yeah. still, yeah. right next to the fire station. Um, well, not the Ward barber shop. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, uh, Jack's barber shop was up on Main, um, near the corner of Walcott Street. Okay. Right. Okay. And um, he, he barbered pretty much in, uh, until he died, and he, he was an alcoholic, and he, he got into um, uh, AA uh, throughout New England. And um, just last night, uh, one of the members of the class of 59 was, said, told me a story. He was in Florida, uh, and someone down there um, was talking to him when he heard he was from Hopkins about Jack Danahy and how he had... Uh, the impact he had helped. Well, is he? I, I happen to know because I. So I've heard there was a very famous AA person in town, affiliated um, with the with the barber shop. So is that who you're That's speaking Jack. of? Yeah. Yes. So he, I guess, <clears throat> was a tremendously successful group. Yes, he, yeah. he had a he had a powerful uh, yeah. impact. Yeah. On, on uh, his his uh, funeral packed St. John. That brings me to another dimension of, of my memories of the town um, growing up. I had been thinking of being a priest, and I was into being an altar boy, and I took it very seriously. So I got to serve all kinds of funerals um, and weddings and all that kind of stuff. So, but I think St. John's played a big role in people's lives. Uh, uh, in the 50s, uh, basically, it was uh, a lot of a lot of there was not much to do in town unless you did it yourself. Whether you know, be the Horribles Parade, or Kiwanis would organize uh, a Kitty's Day with a doll uh, doll carriage parade, a bicycle parade. Oh, I've heard about the doll carriage parade. Yeah, yeah. and uh, three-legged races, and uh, the Kiwanis was just the local businessmen and and friends who organized activities for the kids. And, and that sort of thing. Uh, my mother used to uh, participate in the Women's Guild. Uh, they would put on shows every year, and uh, uh, they were great fun and source of entertainment. They were in the town hall at first. And the Women's Guild, not Women's Club, was it called? It the was guild? MCWG, the Massachusetts Catholic Women's Guild. Oh, okay. Yes, that okay. Was a, uh, a big force for. Uh, Social life. Uh, if you stay after this, I have you know. There's information you could look at. I can bring out some boxes on uh, okay. with St. John's with it. They have some old um, literature and old information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So you have fun. You have good memories about the church then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the school. Let me come back to the school a little bit, because uh, not only did one or two generations of people have some of the same teachers, uh, but you know. Uh, most of the teachers, certainly uh, half of the teachers, all lived in town and, of course, knew the parents uh, personally in their social lives and everything. Uh, that makes it a very different association between you know, yeah. students and, and teachers. And it carried yeah. over for several Yeah, you were going to behave if the teachers knew your parents. <laughs> uh-huh, exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, they, they knew each other all, and half of the teachers, as I say, if half the teachers lived in town, of that half, half of them also went to the same church. Uh, so there were these constant overlapping circles that, that kind of <laughs> kept people together, uh, is, is my feeling for life in the town. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, there wasn't a lot of fast food, if, if any, I don't think, uh, yeah. basically when I think about it. Uh, 
None of the toys had batteries, of course. <laughs> but uh, it was just a different lifestyle where, where people made their own fun. And, uh, Clubs and groups. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and in many, uh, many of the families were larger than they are now. There were some famous families that had maybe a dozen kids or nine, ten uh, kids. And so I had my friends, my brother had his, my other brother had his, Pat, uh, my sister had hers. But in a large family, you, you had not only your friends, but you had all the friends of your brothers and sisters. So that, that, that's a lot of friends and a lot of, you know, activities. Uh, to keep kids uh, yeah, busy yeah. in a certain sense. Yeah, but and everybody's out the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyway. And also in talking to other people, there are the people that I spoke to in Woodville, their parents worked in the same places, so there would be that connection. Your father worked in the same mm -hmm. factory or business where so-and-so's Absolutely. father worked, so yeah. that was like a lot more connections. Right. Yeah. So and we had we, and growing, we didn't have a car until maybe into the mid fifties, for instance. But my father was able to walk to work. Uh, he worked at the mill. Uh, the thread mill. Yeah. The yeah. Mill. Oh yeah. I've talked he, to other people that worked at the thread mill. Yeah. <laughs> he was the shipping clerk, and that post kept him out of World War Two, aside from four babies. <laughs> Wow, that's, that's really neat. <laughs> but when, when the mill closed, I remember he, he'd take us up there to sort of play, and we, we were allowed to slide down the package chute from the second floor to the first floor and end up on, on a big shipping table there, and that was uh, great fun. But, was you know, it we Seaman and Cobbs, right? Mm -hmm. right. Seaman and, yeah, yes, I, there are some exactly. things here yeah. in, the, in this yeah. facility right. belonging to yeah. them. I went to school with Judy Cobb, uh, you know, that's the boss's daughter in a certain sense. <laughs> But the, the Cobbs were involved in, um, you know, uh, activities for the kids. For a while, they used to give us um, dancing lessons in the old town hall auditorium, and the Cobbs would be uh, chaperones and you know, the, teach us manners and politeness and all that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, uh, we, we walked everywhere, whether it was church or uh, work or, or stuff like that. And, you know, of course, teenagers, I could name maybe five or six teenagers who in the late 50s had cars. Teenagers didn't have cars. Either you walked to school or you took the bus. Uh, there, was, there wasn't a, a lot of automobile traffic. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've heard that the roads were very quiet, uh -huh. unlike today. Uh -huh. yeah. And my mother would think nothing of sending us downtown to pick up this at the store or pick up that at the store. Um, you run a tab? Uh, no, no. Uh, she might give me the money, and you know, frankly, sometimes it was just for a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> can, you imagine, can you imagine sending your little kid downtown to get a pack of cigarettes now? <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, but my dad, after the mill closed, my dad, uh, he worked for a couple of uh, years at General Motors and hated it. Uh, and then he was able to get a job at Colella's. Uh, with Tom Kenny, and he worked there for a while. And then Louis Flumer, who owned the Star Package store across the street, I don't know whether Aubrey Doyle might have ended up owning it now, uh, but Louis Flumer got him a job at, uh, at Brandeis, managing the equipment for the golf team. <laughs> so, anyway. Very interesting. Yeah, but yeah, the, the first Danny, he was John, and his son was Tim. Uh, who became the barber and the fire chief and whatnot. Oh, a funny other thing about uh, my uh, grandfather, Tim. Uh, I came across an old poster. He had a band. He was a, a big, gregarious, kind of burly Irishman. Uh, he had a, a band. And this poster was for junior prom at Middlebury College, with, featuring Tim Danahy and his band. <laughs> <laughs> so. Great, great. Do you want to mention people that you knew, friends? Uh, well, I still have a lot of friends. You see, in connection, you, you're connected to them still. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we had our our fiftieth and fifty fifth uh, reunions here, and last night we all the, the class of fifty nine, about fifteen of us, uh, gathered uh, over at the chateau in uh, Westbrook. Uh, we had a good time remembering things. 
uh, you know, the, the silly little tricks that kids put play on uh, their teachers mm -hmm. and uh, whatnot. So we we were, we were recalling all of our um, school teachers. And uh, I had gone to school. In, it's up at the top of the hill as you're leaving town on West Main on the left. I don't know whether it's a factory now, but that used to be called Stigi Prep. Uh, it's it well, yeah, it's it's an office. It's an office building now. Yeah. It, it was the high school until the middle of my freshman year in high school. Well, that was the nickname was Stigi Prep. Yeah, yeah. Right, and uh, we then went into what's now the middle school. That was. Uh, a brand new high school at the time. But that's a, another thing that's, uh, I ended up being in education, so, uh, but I got a good start in the Hopkins school system, you know, way back, uh, and I think the town has always valued the importance of education, and uh, I think they still do that. You know, in Keep going, let me just, okay. yeah, it does, it has a great reputation. Well, I, I recently I've come across uh, surveys in Newsweek and uh, other places ranking the, high, the education system in Hopkinton as among the top 20. So, very impressive. But again, back in those uh, days, all, the teachers all knew your parents and, and actually might have had some socializing with them. Uh, and, uh, that, Kept kids in line. No, we had no. Uh, <laughs> You know, no, the idea that people, there were connections like relationships between teachers and students and parents would probably make for a real comfortable learning environment and support, you know? It was very supportive. Yeah. It was very supportive and, and uh, comfortable. And, and, yeah. and that ties in with the stability uh, right. of, uh, from one generation to the next. Right. Um, the high school principal, uh, when I went to high school, had been on uh, a football team with my father. Uh, when he was a student in high school, and you know, like my the, my third grade uh, phys ed teacher, if you want to call it that, was the retired football coach Chick Welch, who had, okay. had my father right. on that team. Right. So right. Uh, you just had that sense. And many many of the houses, uh, w yeah, they were large families, but sometimes they were the three generational or the four generational. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Every Sunday after uh, church and Sunday school, uh, our job was to walk ourselves down to our grandmother's house and stay there until my father came down and picked us up, and then oh, we yeah. went home. Those for wonderful Sunday, connections. Sunday dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Everybody's saying the you know now that I've spoken to several people, a very similar um, similar points being raised, but you're going into a lot of detail about that. It's wonderful. The connections, yeah. connections between mm -hmm. the different people and families. There, there were some problems, obviously. Um, um, uh, family issues. I think some people have had some bad family memories. and Sometimes that's related to alcohol use and, and sometimes not. But there was not a whole lot of uh, divorce and certainly there weren't any, uh, any drugs uh, really. And, you know, well, there was you know, a little bit of uh, unwanted um, teen pregnancy, I suppose, but uh, there were not a whole lot of, of uh, conflicts or, or tension points. That things tended to be able to get ironed out and um, smoothed over uh, yeah. to a certain degree. Do you recall, would you like to talk about any of the businesses that were on Main Street? The businesses you know? on Main Street. Yes, I can do that. Uh, very early memory of going with my mother to pay the electric bill at the Boston Edison. <laughs> and uh, if we left the door open, she would say, are you feeling sorry for the Edison company? <laughs> <laughs> Which was her way of saying, turn the lights out or close the door and, you know, don't run up the bill uh, on that score. Yeah. 
And it was a first national for a while. Uh, we ended up, you know, being uh, Kalala customers. There was a, another grocery store down the uh, down on uh, Main Street at the bottom near where Hopkent and Drug is now. Uh, Woods Friendly Superette. But we did not go in there. Oh, okay. Uh, we patronized um, uh, Kalala's uh, mm -hmm. store, but where it was in its old location in the middle of the block near Wal Walcott Street. Okay. And then in the new uh, the new location, my father ended up working there. Uh, I served the funeral of um, uh, Danny Kalala tw had a twin brother who died fairly young, and I served that funeral, and it's a vivid memory because uh, Mrs.